This one was ladies? Yes. So our women's group started up again this week. Uh, big shout out to Diane and Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, Diane has got us started on the Elijah Project. And Sarah, thank you. She made these uh, nifty little boxes for all the ladies that have like Bible study supplies in them. And I'm a little jealous. I, yeah, I was thinking about that too. I think we need to try to get her to make something for the men. I, I was trying to figure out why we don't think of ideas like that. I guess we're not creative. I, yeah, I don't know. But thank you, ladies. Uh, we had, I think, 10 people in group, um, like almost half and half on Zoom and in person. If you want to join that and you have not been able to, that's Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. in person and on Zoom. If you did not receive the Zoom invitation last week, please let me know. I'll get that out to you. Um, it will be the same um, link and code each week. So we'll, we'll send out a new Reminder each week, but if you already have that code, you're good to go. Oh, this is a big one. So our children's class is going to be starting April 11th. That so, would be a Sunday night. That's right. Sunday night at mm -hmm. 6 o'clock. It'll be yep, the same time as you, the same time as um, the adults meet, and we're going to be in the gym. That's, I think that's right. Can you help me with ages? So... Who counts as a teen? A teen. A teen. A okay, teen. thank you. <laughs> well, what are, well, I think there's some 12s that are oh, there, okay, maybe. Yeah, you, you, right, okay, how about well, grades? Let's do 6th six six grade to 12th grade. 6th grade to 12th grade will be with the youth, in the youth group with Vicki and James in the youth room. And then kindergarten to 5th grade, that's the gym, the gym. right? That okay. will be the gym, and that I believe Sarah and Diane are the lead. Are they I think there? Sarah, Diane, and Jill are all going to be leading okay. that. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have lots of fun activities. If you have a child younger than kindergarten, please talk to us. We'll try to arrange that. We are working to reopen services as fast as we think we safely can. So we are going to be in the gym, nice and spread out, and we're going to give it a shot. Thank you very much to our leaders who stepped up to help. And uh, this is kind of our, our plan right now, that Sunday mornings are the time for us to all be together and worship all as one. And then Sunday evenings are going to be our time to break out and be fed specifically based on our age group. And once again, it's April 11th at 6 So that's the Sunday after Easter, if you're counting there. I think we're close to done with announcements. Yay. Oh, YouTube, that's a good thing. Let's keep going. Okay, that's all our announcements. Uh, we'd like to offer a prayer for the offering. While we do this, I also want to let you know um, that next week for Easter, we will be taking a special offering. Um, each year on Easter, we do a special offering to benefit missions. So you might hear us use the words World Evangelism Fund. So in our denomination, the money that we donate to missions all goes directly to missions. And our church calls that the World Evangelism Fund. So twice a year on Easter and Thanksgiving, we take special offerings that go completely to the World Evangelism Fund. So we will be taking a special offering next week. We wanted to give you a heads up in case you'd like to participate in that offering. You can do that here in the church by uh, writing on the envelope um, when you put your money in. World Evangelism Fund or Easter offering, you can write either thing. And uh, online, you can give us a note if you donate there as well. Um, we are very blessed in our denomination that um, we have this chance to give in these different ways. When we give to Alabaster, we know that all of our money goes to Alabaster. When we give to World Evangelism Fund, we know that all of our money is going to missions. Um, I think you know that this year has been a difficult year for missions, as travel restrictions have been an issue, getting visas have been issues, and um, we've had some missionaries who have not been able to go to their assignments because they've not yet raised all their funds. And so we want to try the best we can to help support global missions. Uh, as, as James is learning in his uh, History of the Church of the Nazarene class, we actually had missionaries before we had a denomination. And that has been a passion of ours as a denomination from the very beginning, that we are a local church, but we are also a global church that we are a part of the body of Christ around the world, and we believe it's our job to help support that the best we can. So that'll be an opportunity for next Sunday. Just want to give you a heads up. So now please join me as we pray for our offering today. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this chance to be together. Thank you for your blessings. 
Thank you for the palms waving and the psalm that is sung. Thank you for the gift of your son and all that that means to us. Father, as we prepare for Holy Week, please help us to give our whole selves to you. I know that right now we are praying for the offering that goes in the baskets, but Father, we don't just offer that to you. We offer our whole selves, our whole lives. Father, we pray that you would guide us as we do this. Help us to offer ourselves in the ways that you would have us offer ourselves. Help us to rest when you call us to rest and help us to serve when you call us to serve. Help us to give where you lead us to give. Father, as a church, I pray that you would help us to have wisdom as we, as we, as we administer the resources of the church, both people, time, money. Father, help us to be good stewards of all that you've trusted us with. Thank you for this time to come together today and worship. And please be in our hearts and our minds as we sing songs to you and spend time in your word. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Um, as our worship team is coming up, I do want to make one final announcement. Um, we received word this morning that Barbara Dabo's husband, John, passed away. And so we'd like to ask a special, uh, a special moment of thought and prayer for Barbara and her family. Um, there will be a service for John on Wednesday, the 31st, this coming Wednesday at 11 a.m. at Lawnside Cemetery. So if you'd like to come out and support Barbara and her family, um, we want to let everybody know that that's going on so you can join her and uh, comfort her in her time of mourning. Uh, thank you, worship team. And we are going to sing a song, Praise is Rising. i got to tell you, I don't think we can sing a song like this sitting down. So we ask if you would please stand and join us as we sing Hosanna, to our King.
scripture for today is from Psalm 118, 1 through 2, and then 19 through 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. Thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me Father God, we come before you in celebration of your love. I thank you for this song. I thank you for the promise that it shares with us. Father, I thank you for the promise that there's no wall that will separate us from you, no darkness that can hide us from you. Amen, Father. I thank you for your word that gives us these promises from Psalm 139 to Romans 8, these promises that Nothing can ever separate us from your love that's revealed perfectly in your Son. And that even if we wanted to, there's nowhere we could go to hide from you. Wherever we go, you are already there. Fathers, we come together today to celebrate Palm Sunday. We do it with mixed emotions. We join those people and we sing these words that recognize your son as our savior. We wave these palm branches in honor of his royalty and respect to him. But Father, we also know the rest of the story. We know what happens next. We know that these people who called your son by his royal title, who welcomed the son of David into Jerusalem, are the same people that just a few days later were chanting to crucify him. Father, we know that we have done this. We know that there have been times in our lives where one day we sang your praise and the next day we walked away from you. Father, I pray that this season of Lent leading into this Holy Week, I pray that our special services full of your scripture this week would help us to turn our hearts completely to you. Father, help us to learn from these people. Help us to learn that your son is the only way, that he is our truth, and that he is our life. Father, help us to not forget that. And I don't just mean in our heads, I don't mean that we would forget the actual name of Jesus, but Father, help us to consistently make Jesus our shepherd. Help us to make your son the ruler of our life. Father, help us to lay down the expectations from ourselves and from our world and from our culture. Help us to lay that all down and take on the burden and yoke of your son because we know that his yoke is easy and his burden is light and he is a gentle and loving master. Father, help us to do that, please. I know that we do things out of habit because they remind us of your son. We wave the branches and we have communion because they teach us to remember. But Father, I pray that this holy week, the things that we do would not be out of habit. Whether it was getting up early on Easter morning to celebrate the empty tomb or like today, waving those palm branches. Father, help us not to just worship you in word, but with our hearts. 
with all that we are. Help this truth to mean something. And please, Father, help it to change us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. I want to start by talking about substitutes. Have you ever had to accept a substitute? You ever had that happen? I know there's the meme going around where you ask for one kind of soft drink at the restaurant and they offer you another and it's so disappointing. When I was thinking about substitutes, uh, I was thinking about trying to get toddlers to bed. I know many of you have experienced that unique mix of joy and pain that is trying to get a toddler to sleep and uh, made me think of my children. They both had their, uh, their lovey, I guess you could call them transitional objects if you want to use formal terms, but they both had their little stuffed item that they liked to have with them at night. Um, in our house, we had Bunny and uh, Lammy Little Fella. Don't I'm not forget monkey. And don't forget Monkey, that's true. Um, and you know, when you're a little kid and it's time for bed, you need that thing, right? Um, when we're little, it may be a pacifier. When we're older, it may be a stuffed animal. When we're even older, it might be a blanket or a pillow or, or uh, something that reminds us of someone. I know my wife has uh, a blanket that was given to her that belonged to her grandfather. He used to take a nap under it every afternoon. You know, we get these objects or that, that on their own, they don't really mean much. But when we connect them with love they begin to mean something, right? And, and when the love is the thing that we're connecting to, there's no such thing as a substitute. Now, we can joke about um, artificial sweeteners or your favorite soft drink, but really I'm talking about love. I'm talking about the good stuff. I'm talking about God. That with God, there, there are no substitutes. Well, that's true. We do many things to try to fill that hole. We do many things, but, well, they're just not the same. And so today, we celebrate, as I said, a bittersweet moment <clears throat> in history. We celebrate the moment when, when these people in, in Jerusalem recognized Jesus as he entered the city. When he got to enter that city that last time before his arrest and execution, he got to enter as the king. That's what these palm branches mean. That's what all this is about. You know, for these people, it's kind of heartbreaking that they recognized who Jesus was and then turned their back on him. And um, I know we started today with a celebratory tone, and we're going to finish that way. But in the middle, we have a tough conversation to have. And it's going to start here with this scripture. I'd like to read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. We're we'll reading verses 1 through 11. And this tells the story of Jesus' approach and entry into Jerusalem that day. Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem... They came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one else has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessings on the coming kingdom of David! Praise God in the highest heaven! So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left 
because it was late in the afternoon, and then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. As we join the story today, it's the beginning of what many of us would call Holy Week, the the season of Lent that we've been talking about, the time of preparation, is now coming to fruition. The three years of Jesus' ministry on earth have led to this moment. He has spent years traveling around the countryside and in the cities, teaching people, telling them what the scriptures really mean, trying to teach them who he is and why he's there, trying to tell them who God is and what God really wants of them. He's been with them intimately. He's met their needs. When they were hungry, he gave them food to eat. When they were lost, he showed them the way. When their children were sick or even possessed by evil spirits, Jesus was there to take care of them. And it's all led to this moment where Jesus comes back into the city of David, the holy city, the city where the temple is. And it's at the season when the Jewish people were celebrating the Passover. And we have to really talk about that for a moment if we're going to talk about the Easter story. We have to talk about <clears throat> excuse me, why they were there during that time, why the people had gathered together, and what they were there to talk about. See, many years before this, the nation of Israel wasn't really a nation. Um, when we first really meet this nation, they're really not a nation at all. It's just a guy and his wife wandering around with some sheep. Uh, when we first meet them, it's just Abraham and his wife Sarah and some servants and some animals. And God makes this covenant with Abraham. God makes this promise that if Abraham follows him and worships him alone, that, that God will turn Abraham into a great family, make him into a great nation, and that not only will he have many descendants, but he will give them a land, and he will be their God, and they will live in this, this new place, this promised land. Well, Abraham and Sarah, they pass away with just two children, Um, One of them is an illegitimate child who's chased off. So really, they're just left with Isaac. Isaac has twin boys who uh, don't get along so well, but one of those sons is named Jacob. And through some of his own life experiences and some troubles in following God and not following God, he ends up in a wrestling match where he's given a new name of Israel. And Israel has 12 sons and those sons end up living in Egypt. I'm cutting out some of the details here. You can read the book of Genesis if you want all of it. Um, But these 12 sons and their families and their herds end up in Egypt during a famine, and they stay there. They settle in the land of Goshen, which was a a green and lush pasture, was fed by the flooding of the Nile, so it would get water and silt. It's a wonderful place to raise animals. And while there, they multiplied. They had lots of kids, And they became a great nation. But they were multiplying so fast that it frightened the leadership of Egypt. So the Egyptian ruler decided to make them slaves. Through God's love and protection, through Moses and his brother Aaron and um, the plagues, um, Jesus, sorry, Jesus, Moses leads the people out of captivity, out of Egypt. The very last plague that is sent on Egypt is, well, the the death of the firstborn. The people were given these instructions for the Passover that they were to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of that lamb and mark their doorway with it. Then they were to cook that lamb and eat it with their coats and shoes on, ready to walk. And that overnight, the angel of death would pass over Egypt. And any home whose door was not marked by the blood of a lamb Well, that home would lose their firstborn son. And that's what happened that night. The firstborn of Egypt, even the prince, um, died. And so the next day, the Israelites wake up and they march out of Egypt. Now, there's some dots to connect along the way before they end up in the promised land. But now that they are a nation and they have the city of Jerusalem and the temple, they come together each year to celebrate that moment of Passover, to celebrate that time when God saved them, when God reached out to them, heard their cries, and brought them out of slavery and from slavery into the promised land. So all the people were 
commanded to celebrate this Passover, and that's what's happening at this moment in history. Jesus and his disciples are coming into Jerusalem as part of this Passover celebration. So this city is just overflowing with people, overflowing with Jewish people who've come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, you and I, we have the, the privilege of, of hindsight. We have uh, texts such as the book of Hebrews that teach us about Jesus being the Lamb of God and the High Priest of God. And so we understand a little bit more to this story than they all did back then. See, when Jesus entered the city, he really was reenacting what happened at Passover, except he was the whole deal. He was both the lamb who was sacrificed to save the people and the high priest who was holy and allowed it to happen. Now, these people that day, they knew what he had said. He had spoken clearly several times. He had told his disciples and the crowds that he was going to come to Jerusalem and he'd be turned over to the leaders and that he would be executed and that the third day he would rise from the grave. But these people, whether it was stubbornness or confusion or distraction, they didn't seem to understand what Jesus was saying, not all the way, but they did get some of it. They did get some of it. So when Jesus comes to the city that day, when he comes to Israel, or when he comes to Jerusalem, he's coming to a city full of people who are there to celebrate the goodness of God, how God freed his people from foreign dominion and how he gave them their own land. But see, it's a a tricky thing to celebrate the Passover during that time because even though they had Jerusalem and they had the temple, they did not really have their freedom. They weren't a nation of slaves, but they were under the thumb of Rome. The nation of Israel, like most of the known world at that time, had been conquered by the Roman Empire. And so, as they were coming together to celebrate how God had freed them from Egypt, it wasn't far from their minds that they also wanted God to free them from Rome. That they wanted to reenact what happened. They wanted a prophet like Moses. They wanted a warrior like David. They wanted a savior. They wanted God to come in and change things. And so when Jesus comes into the city, that's what they celebrate. They celebrate that here is a prophet. Here is the one sent by God. Those are the words that they use. In their pain, in their fear, with their expectations, they were grasping. They wanted to be saved, and they wanted Jesus to do it. The problem was... They weren't really listening to Jesus. They wanted Jesus to do it their way. And they didn't really listen to what he was trying to say. They didn't hear in their hearts who Jesus was trying to tell them he was. Jesus never came to the people as a warrior. He never came to the people as a military leader. He came as the son of God. See, these people in this occupied city, in this occupied nation... Well, they were doing whatever they could do to get along. Um, Some people, like the Pharisees, they leaned into their faith. They leaned into the books of their ancestors. Um, But it wasn't really about the faith. It was maybe seeking comfort in legalism, how often sometimes when our lives are out of control, we seek to overly control the few things that we can. Part of their lives were out of control, so they sought these laws to try to put things into line. And Part of the reason they were doing what they're doing, part of the tradition of the Pharisees was that if they could just all follow the rules for one day, the Messiah would come and save them. So that was their path to try to have God take care of them. Now, there were others like the tax collectors or some of the local leaders who, well, they were were, uh, going along to get along, you know. They were colluding. People like the tax collectors, people like Levi who we come to know as Matthew. People who, they've not completely abandoned their Jewish roots, but they are trying not to make waves. They're just trying to keep their heads down and survive. 
And if you've had a tough season in your life, maybe you know what it's like to do that, to try to just put your head down and survive. And here in the midst of all this, all these different kinds of people, people like the zealots who were ready to kill to, to bring about freedom, or the Pharisees who were you know, putting so much time and energy into memorizing all these rules, or people like the tax collectors who were just trying to survive and maybe get a little extra on the side while they were. In the midst of all this, Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem. Now remember, he doesn't come riding in on a war horse at the head of an army. He comes riding on a colt, on a donkey. Now the fishermen have put their jackets on the donkey. You know, Jesus doesn't have a saddle. So he's riding this donkey with the jackets on it, with his ragtag band of disciples that contain all these different people. People who had been um, Orthodox Jews, we might call in today's language. He had Simon the Zealot, who was ready to carry his dagger and do violence in order to, to bring about his political views. He had people like Matthew, who had been a tax collector, who had colluded with the Romans in order to get along and also to make a profit. He had people like Luke, who were Gentile, who just saw his truth and wanted to follow him. This kind of, uh, I guess the joke that comes to my head is the bad news bears of evangelism. <laughs> they come rolling in to Jerusalem, and when they do, the crowds react, they respond. You see, Jesus, people believe different things about him. Some people believed what he said, some people believed what others said, but one thing that I think none of the people could deny is that he was significant. This guy was different. When he spoke, it was different from the way other people spoke. And then there were the signs and wonders, the miracles. People like Lazarus who were walking around who had been in a grave. And not just a little bit dead. He was all the way dead. You know? He was dead multiple days. Multiple days, yeah. You could not deny that Jesus was significant. But what was he actually going to mean? See, these people, they did the thing that I think so many of us do. They know, but they don't believe. You know, when he came in, they, they followed the rituals. They laid their garments on the ground. They cut the palm branches and laid them. They, they cried out the way they were supposed to, the prayers and praises to God. They recognized in their head and by their words that Jesus was their Savior, that he was coming to fix things. But they didn't really believe in what he said. They didn't really trust in his way of doing things. You ever had a thought like that? I mean, I'll confess that, especially in my earlier days walking with God, I had these thoughts a lot of the time, like, God, do you, do you, don't you, do you know what you're doing? Like, God, did you think about this? Like, maybe we could do it that way. Or, God, did you forget about that? And like, God, did you forget that I have an electric bill due? Because the electric company didn't. <laughs> yeah. Or, God, don't you remember that I have a doctor's appointment? I could really use a miracle right now. If you could just fix things before I get there, it'd save me a copay. <laughs> you know, these, these demands or these bargains or this, this way of mixing in our path with God's path. We have words for it. We might call it personality or we might call it bargaining or really, it's just sin. You know, sin is anything other than what God tells us to do. And when we recognize the power of God, but deny the sovereignty of God, we are in a dangerous place. That's where these people are. They recognize the power of Jesus. They recognize that he can do things for them, things that they want. They recognize that he's powerful enough that if he wanted to, he could take over the Roman Empire. He could overthrow the Romans. He could free Israel. He could kill the enemies and make them what they used to be. He could restore their former glory, make their enemies run in fear and, and give them their borders back. They recognize that he can do these things, but they really they don't want to let him be in charge. They don't want to let him be their sovereign. 
See, these people, they knew when they welcomed him, the way they welcomed him, with their words, with what they did. It was a public display, not just for the other Jewish people in the city to see all the people gathered together for Passover, but also for the Romans to see, to uh, call someone their leader, to recognize someone as the, the son of David while the Romans were watching. Well, that was insurrection. That was insurrection. They knew what they were doing. They knew. But that praise, it didn't last. Those words, that respect, that honor that they pay to Jesus, it soon turns into something very different with people spitting on him and shouting words of derision at him, eventually demanding that a murderer be freed instead of him. They praise Jesus with their words because they want something from him. They call him their king because they want him to do the thing that they've been impatient for. They want God to work the way they want God to work. But they haven't stopped to consider that maybe God has a different way. That maybe the thing that they want or the thing that they expect or the thing that they think they need is, is not what God has in mind. They've only really followed Jesus because they want what he can do. They don't love who he is. They don't recognize him as their savior. The same people who put cloaks on the ground are the ones who chant as Jesus is executed. Because the truth that Jesus offers, it upsets everything. It turns everything upside down. It changes everybody's lives. And some people, the broken and desperate people, people like Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Peter and John and Andrew, those broken, desperate people, they recognized that that was a good and necessary thing. People like Matthew, who changed his name, they knew that Jesus coming in and knocking over the way of things and bringing in a new way of being, they knew it was good and necessary. But see, these other people especially the people in leadership, the people in power. They were comfy. They liked the way things were going. The Romans, well, they liked being in charge. The Pharisees, even though they didn't like the Romans, they'd rather take the Romans over Jesus because at least the Romans let them keep their authority in the temple. You know, Jesus doesn't call us to get in a recliner. Jesus calls us to take up our cross. People wanted Jesus as long as he was putting loaves and fishes in their belly. But when it came time to die, when it came time to surrender who they were, to die to their old self and make Jesus their master, that's when people walked away. It reminds me of the parable of the rich young man. In that story, this, this rich young Jewish man comes to Jesus and asks how to be saved. And Jesus says, well, you've got to follow the rules. <laughs> and the rich young man says, well, I've done all those things. I've kept all the commandments. I, I'm a pious, pious man. And Jesus says, well, there's one more thing. And Jesus tells that rich young man, he says, sell everything that you have, give the money to the poor, and then follow me. And do you remember what that rich young man did? He walked away. He turned his back on Jesus. What that man did is a lot like what these people did that day. They came to Jesus thinking they knew what he was going to say, thinking they could control what he would do. But when he didn't give them the answer that they wanted, they turned on him. The same people who laid their coats on the ground are the ones who knocked him to the ground the ones who beat him and spit on him and cheered for his death. They publicly recognized Jesus one day, but then their hearts turn. Now why? Why would these people do this? I've given a lot of different ideas, you know, different motivations that might have happened in these people's hearts. Honestly, we don't know exactly why all those people did what they did. We just know the big picture. We know, we know some of the 
the, the characters, right? We know the Pharisees had been plotting for quite some time to kill Jesus. The Gospels tell us that for years before this, the Pharisees wanted Jesus dead. They just didn't know a way that they could do it without being left holding the bag. You know, their hearts were bitter and they weren't going to follow him. We know some other people were afraid. I think uh, our friend, you know, our friend Zacchaeus maybe, well, he was brave, but our friend Nicodemus, he wasn't so brave. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe that's why he was there at night. So I think fear was part of it. Maybe they were disappointed. Maybe they wanted Jesus to come, you know, marching into Jerusalem with an army of angels, like the old days where walls fell down and armies were conquered. I don't know. I'm not sure. But I do know this. I do know that they praised God one day and then killed him the next. I do know that. If they had listened to their own words when they cried, Hosanna, they would have understood that Jesus was their Savior, the only way that there was no substitute. Now, you might be saying, Pastor Paul, I didn't hear you say that word, Hosanna. Well, I didn't, because I read from a modern English translation. And sometimes when we translate words into English, we lose a little bit. You know, the, the Bible wasn't originally written in English, and sometimes the words in the original languages have a depth and a flavor that, well, we've, we, we've got to take some time to appreciate. In verse 9 and 10, the word that they're really saying in Greek is Hosanna. Now, you, you heard us sing that, that word in our song, right? Hosanna, praise is rising, that we just sang. If I were to ask you what Hosanna means, well, what do you think? And I know I didn't prep anybody, and I'm going to say, Pastor Tom, you're not allowed to answer this one. <laughs> what do you think Hosanna means? Save us. Save us. Oh, see, now somebody knows they're Greek. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we think of Hosanna as a shout of praise or a, a, a title, you know, Hosanna in the highest, right? Like, you're awesome, Jesus. But really... Literally, what Hosanna means in Greek is save. And, and the, the verb tense is now. Save now. <laughs> That's what Hosanna means. Save now. When these people cry out to Jesus, Hosanna, what they're really saying is, save us now. We need to be saved, and you are the only one who can do it. Save us now. There's some wisdom there, except... They forgot. They went from shouting, Hosanna, save us now, to shouting, crucify him. Because they didn't want him to be in charge. Because they didn't want Jesus to be their sovereign. They wanted what he could do, but they didn't want to listen to what he said. They didn't want to give him their hearts. It's not that different from the story in the Old Testament where the people want God to defeat their enemies or give them food, and then they just complain because they don't like what they get or they want it a different way, or God wants them to do their chores before they get their allowance. They whine like children. They wander through the desert, and they're thirsty, so God gives them water. Then they're hungry, so God gives them manna. And do they say thank you? Well, at first they say thank you, but then you know what they say after that? Oh, we want meat. Then he gives them meat, and you know what they say? I don't like this meat. There's too much of this meat. When we were in Egypt, we had garlic and leeks. Now, I like garlic and leeks as much as the next guy, but, man, it takes some guts to stand before the creator of the world and say, well, we're stuck in the desert, and you're giving us bread and meat, but could you, I'd like a little ketchup, please. Could you, could you run in the kitchen and see what you can find? But that's what we do, right? That's what we do. God gives us what we need, but sometimes we want something else. 
see, Jesus, he was very clear that he is the only way. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. These people, they knew that message. They knew that truth. They knew he was from God. Even the people who didn't like him had to admit that. I mean, to, to, to raise people from the dead, to give sight to the blind, to cast out spirits, to, do the, to walk on water, to do the things that Jesus did, they knew he was from God. But they didn't want him to be their sovereign. And because of that, they went from chanting, Hosanna, save us now, to crucify him. Now, I guess it goes without saying that I wasn't there that day, and neither were you. But we're here today. You know, I heard it said once about the story of Adam and Eve in the fall that maybe part of the importance of that story isn't just that it happened, but that it happens. That just like Adam and Eve, you and I face that choice. Are we going to sin or are we going to listen to God? I think we can apply that same principle to Palm Sunday. See, we don't just remember this day because it happened 2,000 years ago. We don't just remember this day because it's the kickoff to our Holy Week. I think part of the reason this is in the Bible and part of the reason we remember this is because it didn't just happen back then. It happens to us now. We proclaim Jesus as our master with our mouths and then don't do it with our lives. We want what God can give us, but we don't want to follow his ways. We are just like those people. We are just like those people. Remember, with the exception of John, even the disciples ran away. <laughs> even the disciples ran away. So this year, as we come into Holy Week, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, and maybe as you hold this palm cross in your hand. Think about that. I think this is a beautiful thing. I don't mean as an object, by, but by what it means. Because it's tying together these two days, right? It's tying together the palm that is laid on the ground with the crucifixion of Christ. But also, it's an empty cross because he has risen. It reminds me of all those pieces of the Easter story. Now, I know most of you well enough to know that this isn't your first time hearing this story. It isn't your first time hearing about Palm Sunday. It isn't your first time hearing about the passion of our Christ. But I pray that this year it would be new to you. I pray that this year this story would not just be habit. It would not just be something we go back through because we remember it or just because that's the date on the calendar. I pray that this year Holy Week will be a holy time for you. A time to recognize the power and authority of Jesus, to recognize our need for him, but also to recognize the need to give ourselves completely to him, to allow him to come into our hearts, to sanctify them and make them holy. That he has a light burden and he is a gentle master. You see, all these different things we try, that's why we keep messing up. That's why we hurt, because we're trying our own way. God's telling us to go right, and we're over here eating the fruit that he said to leave alone. And, you know, that, that it expresses itself differently in all of our lives, but that's the truth. So this Holy Week, I pray that you will know Jesus fully. I pray that you will know him as the king who triumphantly enters Jerusalem. I pray that you will know him in his moment of pain in the garden as he prays, as he prays to his father before he's arrested. I pray that you will know him in his physical suffering, in his death as he hangs on the cross looking down at his mother. As he dies, as he is forsaken, as he spends three days in the tomb, and as he rises again, our Savior. Jesus, well, he is the way, and there is no substitute for him. He's the only one. Please join me in prayer.
Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the words of your apostle written down. And thank you for the chance to read them and talk about them and meditate on them. Father, I pray that they would saturate deep into our hearts. Father, you know that we like what you can do. Father, you know that when we're sick, we want you to heal us. When we lack, we want you to provide. We're your children like that. We want our dad to take care of things. But Father, please don't let it stop there. I pray that you would help us to give ourselves completely to you. That you would help us to open our hearts to you, to hear your voice, to feel your spirit, and to follow your son. Father, I pray that we would make Jesus our sovereign. That we would be your people, the people you have called us to be. Not so that we could be blessed, but so that the world could be blessed through us. Father, I pray that you would break our hearts for the lost. Break our hearts. Don't let us rest, Father. Don't let us rest. Break our hearts for those who are lost and help us to share light in the darkness. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of your son, and I don't mean that lightly. Father God, I cannot understand what that day was like for you, what it was like to look down and see your son hanging on the cross to see his pain, to know that you could take it away, but that if you did, we would all die. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Help us to hear your word and be changed by it. In Jesus' precious and holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. The worship team is going to come up here in just a second, and we're going to sing a song called King of Kings. That's the recognition, right? That Jesus is the King of Kings. Well, when the King speaks, we've got to do what he says, right? So let's stand and sing praise to our King.
stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame, now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. As you go from here today, let that be your song. Praise forever to the King of Kings. But don't be like those people back then. Don't let those words be empty and false and meaningless. Let them be the song of your life. Make Jesus your Savior and your Lord because he is the only way. Go in God's grace and be his people. May your hearts be broken for a world that is lost. Amen.